Hi, welcome to the second episode of my series Amiga Hardware Programming in C. In this episode, I will introduce the startup and exit code which will be used in most of this course's examples. We will also have a first look at one of the Amiga's coprocessors, the copper. To begin, I wanted to mention that for the majority of this course, I will be primarily focusing on the Amiga OCS and ECH chipsets, mainly because there is much more documentation available. Furthermore, this allows us to write programs that work on an OCS machine like the A1000 as well as an AGA machine like the 4000, 1200 or even the CD32. The startup and cleanup code that I am going to show now is based on the assembly code described in the Amiga Demo Coders reference manual, which is available on Eminem. This document has been written and maintained by members of the demo scene over a number of years, and I recommend it as an interesting read and for further reference on specific topics. I adapted the original assembly code for C and used it in a couple of my own projects to verify that it works as claimed, using UAE to check against multiple operating systems versions and hardware configurations. In some cases though, my own findings did not match the claims of the document, so I left out those parts out of this code for the sake of simplicity and clarity. This is the base structure of the main program. As you can see, there is a display initialization part and a display reset part. This is to ensure that when the program exits, we will return to the workbench screen as we have previously left it. The operating system is essentially kept running as it is and we simply set the current task to a higher priority so it will get more CPU time from the scheduler. This also means that we can use many of the operating system functions and utilize its input handling system. The how to code document recommends a priority value of 127 and this will work for the example shown here. Just be mindful that if you install your own input handler later, for example, to handle keyboard events, a higher priority will potentially keep the input device task from getting any CPU cycles. The operating system's input handler runs at priority 20, so if we set our task priority to 20 as well, both tasks will get CPU cycles and we will still be able to receive keyboard input. I will now explain the individual sections in detail. The role of the init display function is to make the screen display available to our program and determine whether we have a PAL or an NTSC machine. The load view null call is supposed to set the display related hardware registers to an empty view and the subsequent wait UF calls are to ensure that the copper has finished processing the previous copper lists before we install our own copper list. I will talk a bit more about the copper later, but just as a quick explanation that wait a TOF is called twice because there are cases where there are two copper lists in use, for example in interlaced displays, and this is to make sure both lists have been processed. The next section determines um, whether we are running on a PAL or an NTSC system. We do this by checking the display flags in the base structure of the graphics library. Note that I did not explicitly open the graphics library. VBCC and a few other C compilers for the Amiga can automatically open and close many standard libraries by simply using the minus L order switch to link the auto library, which can be quite convenient and reduce the amount of boilerplate code we have to maintain. So all I have to do is to declare that pointer to the graphics library base that will be generated by a VBCC and use it to query the display flags. Let's look at the main part of the main function. Here we set the pointer for copper list 1 to a pre-initialized copper list that will be used for our program. As shown in the previous episode, we use the custom variable that the C compiler provided in order to access the custom chip registers. The wait mouse call simply waits for the left mouse button as seen in the previous episode. Let's have a brief look at the program's copper list. I specified macros for two copper commands and three symbolic constants that we are using here to improve the readability. Note that the list has to be located in chip memory. 
We can tell VBCC to reserve chip memory by using the underscore underscore chip modifier. This list generates a pattern in the colors of the German flag, which is achieved by setting the background color at certain vertical screen positions. The first copper move tells the computer to output the colors stored in color register 0 to the screen. We do this by setting only the color burst output bit in the BPL CON0 register to 1 and leaving the rest at 0. We start with the background color black and switch to red at 1 3rd of the screen and finally to yellow at 2 3rd. The last copy instruction in the list is a wait to end of display instruction after which the copper will restart processing the list from the top again. More about this a bit later. The role of the last part of our code is to restore the workbench display. As you can see here, there is a call to load view using the last active view stored in the graphics library base as a parameter. This reinitializes the display related registers for that previously active view. The two wait TOF calls wait for the copper to finish processing its lists before we set the copper list one pointer back to the workbench's copper list. The final rethink display call rebuilds the display of the workbench screen. And this is how our simple startup program looks within the emulator. Since this is using a copper list for a PAL display, I have configured FSUAE to emulate a PAL Amiga 500 system. Much of the topic of Amiga hardware programming involves talking to the components that are contained in the custom chips. This course is based on an unexpanded Amiga 500 or 1000 in order to support as many classic Amiga machines as possible. As such, when I am talking about the custom chips, I mean the OCS ECS chips Agnes, Paula and Denise. We control these by writing data to and reading from memory addresses in a specific range of the Amiga's addressing space. As a gross simplification, the Agnes chip contains functionality to access the custom chip memory. Denise is responsible for video display and sprites. And Paula takes care of audio, I.O. and interrupts. In detail, it's of course not quite as simple as that. The Agnes chip contains the two coprocessors, copper and blitter, and we will now have a look at the former. The copper is unique in its capability being able to wait for certain raster positions and perform operations on a range of custom chip register addresses. To achieve this, it is equipped with a set of three instructions. I haven't really talked about the raster yet, so let's have a brief look at its structure. I will explain just enough to understand how the copper operates, and I recommend to read up on the details if you are interested in learning more. It's 2016 and most of us don't really use CRT screens on a regular basis anymore. But to understand the display of a classic machine like the Yamiga, it is helpful to use a CRT as a conceptual model. In this model, the display is generated by an electron ray that wanders from left to right and top to bottom as illustrated in this image. Also shown here are the horizontal and vertical blanking areas where the electron ray is repositioned to the beginning of a line on the top of the display. Now imagine that we divide the positions of the electron ray into a grid of discrete coordinates that we can represent as integer numbers in a chip register. This is the raster. The copper has direct access to these coordinates and can utilize them in a specialized program which is called a copper list. Let's take a look at the structure of a copper list. A copper list is simply a sequence of 16-bit word pairs that each represent an individual copper command. There are three different instructions in the copper's instruction set. Move simply writes a value into the specified chip register. Wait causes the copper to wait until the electron ray reached 
or past the specified position and skip causes the copper to skip the next instruction if the electron ray reached or passed the specified raster position. We will now look at each instruction individually. The copper move instruction has a fairly straightforward structure. The first instruction word contains the register address and the second word is the value to store in that register. It might be interesting to point out that the copper addresses the registers relative to address 0, while the CPU sees the chip registers relative to address hex DFF000, because the 68K has a much larger address space. The register is specified in the lower 9 bits of the first instruction word and bit 0 is always set to 0, so the copper can easily tell that it's a move instruction. Since the chip registers all have a 16-bit size, accessing odd chip addresses is not necessary anyways. Another thing to point out is that there are some chip registers that the move instruction cannot access. Typically, the copper has access to most chip registers. However, there is a restriction in the range from address 0 to hex 7e, which includes the blitter related registers. It is possible to enable the range from hex 40 to hex 7e by setting bit 0 in the COPCON register, which is also known as the copper danger bit. This allows the copper to control the blitter. The hardware reference manual seems to be a bit confusing about the accessible register range, but you can look up the details in appendix B of the HRM. The copper weight instruction causes the copper to halt execution until the electron beam has either reached or passed the specified position, so the instruction is mostly a specification of a position comparison and how this comparison is performed. A weight instruction always has bit 0 of the first instruction word set to a 1 and bit 0 of the second word set to 0. In addition, the first word contains the beam position to wait for and the second word contains a comparison bit mask. For now, I will not further describe how to use the comparison masks and assume that all mask bits are set to 1. Another bit worth mentioning is the blitter finish disable bit. As previously noted, in the description of the move instruction, the copper can control the blitter and by setting this bit, you can tell the copper to wait for the blitter to finish its current operation before performing any changes to blitter registers to avoid unexpected effects. If we look closer at the position data in the first instruction word, you'll notice that the number of possible positions we can theoretically represent is 256 vertical and 128 horizontal. We get 128 horizontal positions if we consider that because bit 0 is always set to 1, it is not used in the comparison and therefore we can only wait for even positions. Now let's consider that both PAL and NTSC displays contain more than 256 raster lines and more than 128 horizontal pixels on the Amiga. The actual number of horizontal positions that we can observe with the copper is 113, which corresponds to all even values between 0 and hex E2 or decimal 226. The reason why this is a smaller number than the horizontal lower res resolution is that each of those horizontal positions corresponds to four lorus pixels. For vertical positions, the case is a little more complicated. If we want to wait for a line greater than 255, we need to use a trick that involves two wait instructions. The first wait instruction waits for horizontal position 0 and line 255, which is the largest value we can represent with 8 bits. Now, when the vertical position is increased by 1, the 8-bit value actually overflows and wraps around to 0. We can take advantage of that and wait for the desired vertical position past 255. For line 256, we would wait for vertical position 0. For line 257, we wait for position 1 and so on. By the way, NTSC has a total of 262 lines and PAL has 312 lines resulting in 6 and 56 additional lines, respectively. Finally, one special form of the wait instruction that you see in almost every copper list is a wait-to-end instruction. 
which is essentially a weight for an impossible position, typically raster line 255 and horizontal position 254, or hex FF and FE. Remember that while the copper can go past line 255, there is no way it can ever reach position 255 vertically in combination with position 254 horizontally. Because the maximum horizontal position is hex E2 or decimal 226. This instruction is therefore typically used as the last instruction in the copper list. What happens in this case is that the copper tries to wait for an impossible position and eventually reaches the end of the display. When that happens, it starts processing the copper list from the beginning again. The copper skip instruction almost looks like a wait instruction, except that bit 0 in the second instruction word is set to a 1. The difference is in the behavior when the comparison condition is true the next instruction in the copper list that follows the skip instruction is skip. For many use cases we won't need the skip instruction, but it can enable the programmer to create very sophisticated copper programs. Let's take a brief look at the copper related chip registers. First we have the location registers, where one pair of registers store the higher order and lower order words of one of two possible copper lists that must be located in chip RAM. If you set this address with the CPU, you typically write the entire 32-bit address at the address of the high word register, which will automatically write the low word into the low word register as well. Second, we have the strobe registers. When you write any value to either of these registers, the copper will restart itself using the copper list that is pointed to by the corresponding location register. So cop jump 1 will jump to copper list 1 and cop jump 2 will jump to copper list 2. Normally you won't have to touch the strobe registers because the copper automatically restarts the program counter at the start of the vertical blanking interval. It becomes useful however when you are using the second copper list as well or for any reason want to force a restart of the copper list processing. Finally we have the copcon register which contains the copper danger bit. As previously mentioned, this allows the copper to access the normally restricted chip register range. Now after we had a look at how the copper works, let's look at the copper list in our example program again. Hopefully it will have become a little clearer how our program tells the copper to use our own copper list and what the individual lines in the copper list do. As always, you can find the example program in the GitHub repository for this series and I encourage you to experiment with it and create your own copper lists. Hope to see you next time. Thanks for checking in.